Hey, Lisa, welcome to the Self-Help Antidote. Good to have you here. Oh, it's just absolutely wonderful to be here. Thanks so much for having me. We finally got here, mate. <laughs> I know. This, that, there's been a little bit of a logistical a um, hurdles. <laughs> so, yeah, what, what we're trying to say is, like, we cannot get our shit together. That's what we're trying to say. So it's taken, yes. like, multiple attempts. Yes. And, and we've sorted it out. We've got the time zone straight. And now here we are. Off to the races. It's brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, speaking <laughs> of races, accidental segue here. Um, you've been, for the past 25 years, an elite athlete. I mean, I mean you, you, you participate regularly in races where people will be like, okay, this or like root canal every day for the rest of your life, they might choose root canal. I mean, you, you ran through <laughs> Death Valley and lived. What? <laughs> A couple of times, yeah. <laughs> I guess the question yeah. is, in a world where most people wake up and like, all right, go to the coffee shop. No, it's a little bit cold. Not not me, by the way. Like, I'm completely committed to the coffee shop. I go, no matter what the weather. But, you know, other people, what is it that moved you or pers persuaded you to get involved in being an athlete at that level? Well, it is you know, like it, it, it's not something you just roll into. Like I didn't, you know, grow up going. I'm going to be an ultra marathon runner one day, and that's going to be my life. I had no idea. I have no talent. I let's. I want to preface this from saying I have very, uh, you know, lack of talent. So I've been an asthmatic since I was a, a two year old. Um, I have a very small lung capacity. My VO two max is not great for an endurance athlete. Um, but I, what, what I did have was a burning desire for adventure and pushing sort of the limits. And I grew up in a world where, in my family, being tough was cool. And being physically and mentally tough was cool. And weakness was... It's like, you are going to represent New Zealand in, in your sport. You are going to train your ass off. You are going to do, you know, like this sort of a upbringing. He was a wonderful dad, but he was also one of those, you know, ones that you really wanted to please. So or early and, in uh, your life. So I think that shaped a lot of things. So you have this, this value, this core value of adventure. And then, you know, a lot of us shaped by the expectation of our parents. So you have this hard expectation mm. and a built-in family reward system for going out and being tough and doing shit that's just really difficult. And what, what was your first yep. experience where you confronted something like, like, like an extremely difficult athletic endeavor and, and meeting the reality of those challenges? How did that imprinting show up for you from your dad? Like, like what, what was that experience like? Well, yes, yeah, that's, that's, that's a hard one. Like, I think I grew up as a gymnast. So gym, gymnastics was my sport as a kid, my main sport. And um, that's a really brutal sport, really, to be in. Um, Absolutely. Especially once you get to, like, puberty. So I was doing really well up until that point. I was quite coordinated. I was quite good at it. You know, I was on track to, to maybe representing the country one day. Um, you know, my cousins had done it, which made it even worse. Um, and then I had puberty. And then I grew too tall and too uh, muscular and too too big, basically. And it was the wrong size, size and shape. And so th then I got um, totally uh, hassled all the time by my coaches for being fat. And I was like a 12-year-old girl who was not fat, but I was told I was fat the whole time. So that completely warped my my self-esteem of who I was and my, you know, body image and all of that sort of stuff. So that sort of led into, you know, a lot of self-hate and a lot of, a lot of uh, failing. So you, ex and, you and accepted that, that was my first. Well, yeah, as a, as a 12, 13 year old, you, you, t you believe what you're told and you're told that you are overweight and mm -hmm. you're bigger than the other girls. Like it's just, you know, genetically a bigger person. Um, then you know you you just that, that affects who the heck you are and what you think you can do and um so i started then to for, for the first time in my life really to, to flounder a little bit and to fail and uh i wasn't successful in my my career anymore and i it got, got to a point where the pressure was so much that i decided to quit but that was a a big decision you know like that was 
having to go back and tell dad that I'm quitting gymnastics was a big deal, you know, and he was like, yeah, but you're just about to break through and you're just this and you're just that. And I knew I wasn't. Um, so that was a, a, a sort of a, a very forming thing in those young formative years, you know, when you're, when you, especially as a young woman, you know, developing curves and all of those sorts of things. And that was just not, you, you should be staying little and tiny and, you know, is it not a good, not a, not a healthy environment to be in for a young lady, I don't think. So what was that like having that conversation with dad? Like, did you know how that was going to go in advance? No, it didn't go well, <laughs> um, but he, he did eventually accept it and, and I pulled out, but I felt like I'd failed him and mm. he said, right, you've got to find another sport to represent the country. And so then I took up surfing and my brothers, uh, we also into surfing and they excelled at it and they were brilliant and I was bloody hopeless. Um, <laughs> when I say hopeless, I was okay, but I, I really had to work hard to be any good at it. And so I failed at that as well. Um, and so by the age of 21, I was sort of not doing too well and didn't, you know, didn't, didn't succeed too well in the sporting arena. And, but I stayed, I, I held this dream for a long, long time. Right. And I thought one day I'm still going to do it. And so to jump ahead in the story, um, I got to the age of 42 before I finally represented my country. And I did it in something called 24 hour racing where you run around a track, a 400 meter track for 24 hours. Can you imagine anything more boring and horrific than that? But I felt, yep. I, I'd heard that if you, if you represent New Zealand, uh, if you, if you could get 185 kilometers, which I don't know how many miles that is, but it's, it's a fair whack of miles, about 120 miles or something. Um, in in 24 hours, then you can represent your country and you can qualify. So I tried this and I tried it for eight years, <laughs> eight years of, of 24 hour racing to try to qualify. And I failed and I failed and I failed. And then finally, at the age of 42, I did 194.3 kilometers and got the national title and ended up being able to represent my, my country. And so at the age of 42, wow. I went back to my dad and said, yeah, you old bugger. <laughs> hold, 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 on your wall. <laughs> that is an extraordinary accomplishment. I, I want to, I want to revisit that in a second, but what did dad say? What was, what was the response <laughs> after all those years? <laughs> he'd mellowed a little bit, but he'd sort of said to me, well, it only took you about 25 years longer than I was planning for you to get there, but good on you. At least you saw it through, you know, <laughs> so he was you, a have this, you have this environmental construct where you need to be the person dad expects you to be. And you said earlier yep. where, you know, I failed him and then, you know, surfing, my brothers excelled at it. Oh, I failed at it. Yep. But that's yet, how I felt at, at the time. It, 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 understandably. Yet at 42, you do something that, I mean, you know, it's absolutely remarkable. It's not remarkable because it's at age 42. It's remarkable to do that at any age, yeah. but it's interesting that all those years later, after eight attempts, you finally did that. What yeah. would you say your belief system or relationship with failure was? And, and, and how did that impact you qualifying? I think um, I'm just a, I never give up person. So I like, and that can be a good thing and that can be a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'll tell you a story about never giving up later, which was a good thing, but sometimes that can be a bad thing when you hang on for too long and you're flogging a Definitely. dead horse. But in, in this case, um, you know, it, it, it's a, I, I, when I get my teeth into something, uh, I just keep going until I get there usually. And only, you know, recently as I've hopefully matured a little bit and got a bit wiser when I've sort of known when to quit <laughs> because you can go to the point where you actually kill yourself. And there have been a number of races where I've pushed my body and my mind so hard that I've nearly not come out the other side. And that's not worth it. You know, that's, it's, not, it's not worth dying for any race. You know, there is no race on the planet worth dying for, really. Um, and, and sometimes you can push too hard. So there's a, there's a bit of a double-edged sword to that one. But I think I, I, I see failure now as, as something that you have to go through in life and that is not pleasant, but it's, it is, you know, the biggest learning curves. I've had the most, you know, growth, I'd say, when I've actually had failures and kept going. Um, and that's, I think, it's, it's the getting up 
that is the most important part of that. It's the, I, okay, I got knocked down. I'm, you know, on the ground, I'm bawling my eyes out. I'm in despair. I don't know what the hell I'm doing now, but the next morning I get up again. And now, when that you is say a this, really important thing. Now, now people talk about this. They talk about failure and they talk about perseverance, resilience and, and drive. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 but when you're talking about being down in despair and like, f- like facing almost a, a, a situation that's life threatening. You're not speaking metaphorically in your case, you're speaking literally. That's literally, the difference yeah. between yeah. what you hear in that conversation most of the time. And this, as a matter of fact, you got into a situation at one point where it took you years to recover from a race. Yeah. Yeah. What, yeah. What happened? Uh, so this was, she wasn't a race. It was an expedition. So this was in my early twenties and I was, um, uh, it was a crossing of the Libyan desert, an illegal crossing, an expedition. There was four of us. Now, I'd, uh, an illegal crossing. This. Illegal, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was a military bar zone. We weren't allowed in there. Most incredible, most beautiful desert you've ever seen, though. Like, just absolutely amazing. And no sort of Europeans or Westerners had been through this part of the desert completely so um we had this uh guy who was in charge of the expedition his name was elvis and that was his real name and he was a a yugoslavian (laughs) yeah yeah it's it's got to be a good story with a name like elvis uh so he was a yugoslavian or back in the back in those days it was yugoslavia um yugoslavian survival expert who'd been to this part of the desert uh, 20 years before this and had 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 made a foray into that area and was just blown away with it and so he had planned to do this expedition and we got invited on it the boyfriend and I at the time and um, I'd been in this relationship with the the my my boyfriend then uh, for about five years and it had really he was an extremely talented amazing athlete and I had actually met him he was climbing on our local mountain here he was cycling through New Zealand he was from Austria and he was cycling through New Zealand and he climbed our local mountain and he got hit by an avalanche and um, had to be rescued and my mum had met him the day before this happened and when you know he got lost on the mountain and they then they managed to rescue him and he was badly injured and so mums being mums they decided to look after this poor young lad that's in the hospital and got nobody you know from a foreign country and so she invited him once he got out of hospital, come and stay with us. And, and that ended up us being in a, getting into a relationship. <clears throat> but he had come, uh, he had a lot of issues, shall we say. And, you know, we were both young and I want to, you know, say, uh, you know, don't want to be bagging him out or anything because that's not fair, but it was an abusive relationship at that time and in that stage of our lives. And he would always be telling me that I was useless and hopeless and uh, controlling everything I did and controlling everything I, you know, everything basically. Um, And I lived in Austria with him. So I was separated from my culture, my family, my language. And over time that became really isolating and very, um, a very insular relationship where it was only the two of us all the time. And we were off doing, you know, cycling adventures or climbing mountains or or whatever we were doing, but, or coming home and working in between, but there was no interaction socially with anyone else. And so this was the first time that we'd ever been in a, with, with, with a couple of other people. And um, so we got invited on this, this expedition and 250 odd kilometers that we had to cross and we had to carry everything uh excuse me in our backpacks frog in my throat thinking about it (laughs) need some water (laughs) Um, we had only two liters of water a day and we had like 35 kilo backpacks like no, so 20 oh. litres each, and that was all okay. we could carry. Mm-hmm. And that was enough for two litres a day for 10 days, which is what we worked out as being our maximum time that we could be out there and carry this amount of fluid. We were hoping to get through in a little bit shorter, but we had to ration two litres a day for our starters. Um, two litres and 40 plus degrees heat, uh, the math doesn't add up. Yeah. You need at least nine sort of 10 liters, right? So this we is couldn't carry extremely that. grueling physically. And, extremely. You're, and you're going yeah. there in a stressed emotional state on top of that. So you're heading into exactly. this race, feeling isolated, feeling maybe even suffocated with yet another person who 
you have to shape your behaviors around their expectations. So you're totally, going in like yeah. that. Yeah, let, t- talk yeah, about yeah, that. yeah. And you can see like where that comes from, from dad and, you know, like you pick the wrong type of partner then because you, that's what you know. Um, mm-hmm. You know, looking back at it as an older, wiser, wiser person now and going, yeah, that's probably what I was doing. Um, so anyway, do <laughs> we, we get to this oasis deep and um, it's deep, deep part of, Egypt, so it's on the border area between Egypt and Libya, and we had to disappear into the desert from this military, um, at, you know, outside this military camp there, and uh, you know, run off into the desert in the middle of the night when no one was looking, and um, and so we started our trek, and the dehydration was horrific from the get-go, like it really started to bite really, really quickly. So tempers were very short. And the partner that I was with, he was wanting to do a book on this. Like he wanted to, he was a photographer and he wanted to photograph everything. And Elvis, the the head of the expedition said, well, you can take photos, but you have to keep up because we have to cover 45 kilometers a day with these backpacks on, right? So, and we didn't have maps. We only had aerial images. And so we didn't quite know what the terrain was like. And we had to cover that sort of a distance. So he said, you have to keep up if you're going to take photographs. So the partner wanted me to help him with the photographs, running around doing, you know, putting up tripods or whatever, carrying the gear. Just in case there wasn't. And I just, yeah, exactly. Exactly. I I, I physically couldn't, you know, it was just beyond me. Like I weighed about 59 kilos at the time. I I couldn't even get off the ground with the backpack on, let alone you know, do any extra sort of activities and just putting one foot in front of the other was as, was as tough as it could, I could handle. Um, and so Elvis and the partner, they started to have a, a, a bit of an alpha male fight over the way I was being treated. That, that, that was not okay. And this was a, a bit of an eye-opener for me because this was normal behavior in my life. And so I didn't understand that that wasn't normal behavior. Yeah. And so Elvis didn't okay. recognize this as normal behavior at all. No, he Sounds was like, like he what? you can't treat her. Yeah. He took a stance for me and just said, you can't treat her like that. And this is not good enough. And this heated up over the next couple of days. And the, even though it was very hot in the desert, it was a very icy temperature in the group. And the other thing was that you were also suffering. Yeah, everybody's temper is extremely mm-hmm. short because you, 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 you know, like you, your mouth is swollen, your tongue is swollen, you can't, you know, saliva, you, you can't eat. Uh, it's pretty horrific to be that sort of dehydrated. And so on day four, uh, in, it came to a head and in the middle of the day, and we're all just cowering from the, the midday sun and hiding behind our backpacks because it was the only shelter we had. And he said, right, I'm leaving. And that's the end of the relationship. And I'm out of here. And it came to a head and he, He's he leaving. packed up his in, bags. In the middle of the desert. <laughs> in the middle of the desert after a five-year relationship. He tells me, oh, um, that's it. The relationship's over and I'm off. And I'm, you know, you I started go off to, too in the middle of the desert anyway. Well, he, he was faster and stronger and more capable of moving faster than we were. And, but I was like, I so, Elvis, so Elvis stayed with you. So he yes, just went yes, off on yes. his own. And you still guy. had. Yes. So you, you were still. Yes. With so the he group. didn't leave me completely alone. He left me with the other guys, but it was the end and of the relationship, you know. And of course, when you're you're, you're heartbroken and you're you're confused and your your brain's not working anyway, and I started to fall apart. And then I sort of thought, I can't fall apart here. I've got to get my ass out of this desert somehow. And I owe it to the other two guys not to make any more trouble. So I promised them that I was fine and that I would be okay and that we'd focus. And that really taught me one thing, which was to compartmentalize my emotions from the actions I have to take. Very and valuable. Th- that's helped me a number of times in life. Yeah, where you've, you, you have to function. You, you're falling apart and you're dying inside but you have to function right now to get through something. And that's been a really valuable um, skill to develop. Um, I wouldn't say that I've, you know, always can do that, but it's um, at times when you really need to, that's a good skill to have. So anyway, he disappeared. I was worried whether he'd survive and because, you know, one twisted ankle out there and you're dead, like there's nobody coming to rescue you. Nobody knows where you are. There's nothing. Um, and I f- had to focus on what we were doing. And that, that, it, the, over the next couple of days, we had like sandstorms, the dehydration, but got 
to a point where we're just like, I was passing out all the time. The guys were just having to put me on my feet. Gunter was really also struggling. Um, I and I had been squirreling away some of my water. So I was only having like a liter and a half a day because I was paranoid of not having enough. Mm -hmm. And that was actually a dumb thing to do because that was like the minimum anyway. And you, and it's actually better when you actually take it, you can mm -hmm. actually die with water in your backpack. And lots of people do do that when they go into a situation in the desert where they've actually died with 20 liters sitting next to them because they, they were so busy saving it up that they, their body went beyond. What, yeah, you know. you're, you're down to the minimal you need for survival. That's a, that yeah. is an understandable fear. Yeah. Especially like what if I get stuck? What if things don't work out as planned? Yeah. What if our timing's off? You know, yep. very understandable. So yeah. And so I was squirreling away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we had this one night we had, um, I think it was on the fifth or uh, sixth night, no, sixth night, I think. And it was a massive snow, a, a sandstorm. So in the middle of the night, when we were doing most of a lot of our walking at nighttime, um, cause of the heat and the sandstorm came in really, really quickly. And we had to dive into our sleeping bags and sort of take cover. And cause every orifice, the sand was just like, Oh, I've never seen anything like it. And you were getting buried. And I didn't get time to get my water out of my backpack when I got into my sleeping bag. And so I ended up not refilling, which is what I'd usually been doing at night. Cause you mm -hmm. take the water in at night when your cells can actually take it up rather than sweating it out. And so I didn't have my ration. And then at about three in the morning, the sandstorm passed and we got up and we carried on and I just kept passing out. I'd be walking along, go unconscious. The guys had put me back on my feet and Elvis had done the opposite. He'd drunk a whole day's supply that night. And so he was like recharged, like someone mm -hmm. had plugged a battery in and he was like, we, we've Thankfully got to get that. to this certain place. Well, yes, but yeah, he, if was he was like in the same state power. Yeah, he was, well, he was full power and I was weak. And the day before it had been Gunter had broken, um, but he had full power. So he was pushing it and he wasn't slowing down for us. Like we mm. had to keep up. So he, he just kept putting my, me on my feet and we didn't even stop to get any more water out of the backpack. And he was really pushing to get to this place called the Barbiti Depression that we, so we knew where we were and he knew if we got there, where we were on the map and, and that we would be able to get out sort of thing. So he was going hard. And so I just kept pushing and, and, and falling over. And at this time, Bobby, you, your, your brain is not functioning at all. Like you, like you just hardly functioning because you, you don't have I can only order. imagine what state you're in. Yeah. Like your brain is just, you're not making good decisions. You're, you're as thick as bricks type of thing. And you're just like really foggy. And you, all I could do was follow his, the little flicker of his footsteps. That's all I knew what to do was just follow those shoes, follow those shoes. And so I didn't even ask for water. You know, I was like, and then I started having hallucinations and the rocks turned into monsters. And I thought I was, you know, being chased by monsters. I'm sorry, what? Like, <laughs> rocks turned into monsters like like literally what did you what did you I, I don't mean to stop you here but like like what did you see like what was the extent of this because you hear about people they get into such a state they start hallucinating but yep. if that's not happened to you you don't know what that tell us a little bit more about that if you don't uh, mind. i've had many uh points in my life actually with hallucinations doing you know ultra marathons where you just push beyond and the the, the chemistry in your brain is something's i don't know what it is the dehydration the the heat the, the whatever the gly lack of glycogen um it, it's it's like being in a horror movie in this in this particular case i've had other ones like in Death Valley, I kept seeing these giant penguins and tuxedos clapping for me on the side of the road. I mean, and it's so a penguins has been a was that terrifying or was that actually a little bit encouraging? That was a that was a nice one. That was a nice hallucination. It was like, oh, the penguins are here to clap me on. I don't know why penguins would be in Death Valley, and I thought that was normal. But they, they do seem like very supportive <laughs> animals, to be fair. But um, when you, so in the desert right now, trying to catch up. To, yeah. to Elvis, what was, like, at what yeah. point did you say, okay, these are just hallucinations or is there anything that made you stop and go, whoa, this, this is a little bit too much? No, it's just so out of it. I just thought just, just, just these, they were like shadows moving, you know, like, just like you're just in, in, 
it wasn't even so much as a fear response as just been mm -hmm. like what the hell is happening here right. you know it was just uh like i suppose i've never i've never done drugs but i suppose like a bad psychedelic trip you know maybe you know? um we you just like whoa it a little bit and then we this was in the final time when we'd actually just arrived at this barbie depression and we had to get down this cliff and so how Elvis was just really pushing hard. So he you know, he took me by the hand and he helped me down the cliff because I was like all down all over the place. He got me down to the bottom and then he said, right, so now sit down and you're going to drink for the next few hours. And we're sitting here. I now know where we are. We're going to get out. We're going to be out within two days. You you've you've nearly pushed your body to beyond the point of no return. Um, you have to start drinking now. So that's when I started to to I only got in about a liter or so in that in that time and but I knew that we were going to get out from that point so we had another day's walk ahead of us so and, now you you, stuff. you could see the end for yourself like okay if I yeah. just stay with it this amount of time yeah. it's it's yeah, likely going to be okay we're going to get through yeah we're going to get through but then we had to come in to this other big oasis and it was another military camp and we had to you know, get back in without getting caught. Because if we'd been caught out there, we would have been like arrested as spies, I imagine. Um, and being a woman in a place like that, mm -hmm. it, it's not a good thing, you know, like you, you, you really could have been horrific, you know, it could have been really bad. So we had to get could into the next oasis. And I remember being completely emotionless. And as we're coming out of the desert, and we can see we had to wait for nightfall. We could see the military camp. We had to crawl, you know, alongside the, the the outside perimeter and the guards are in the tower things and with their with their machine guns. And I remember popping this last lolly that I had in my pocket in my mouth and just like looking up at the guard and going, I should be scared, but I'm not, you know, like I just had no more emotion left. I was just like nothing nothing mm -hmm. there and you know crawling along the wall trying not to be seen by the guard and getting into the actual you know civil civil uh, civilization part of the of the oasis where the you know civilians lived and through paddocks with donkeys and stuff and climbing over heaps of walls to get into the actual oasis and we got through and we got out and then the first thing we did when we got there we found this shack with a coca-cola sign on it because this was now on the road right <laughs> this is the, the, the end of civilization type thing but it was on the road there was this little cafe with goat stew and coffee uh coca-cola so <laughs> i just and i had been dreaming of a coca-cola for like <laughs> the, the last you know whole week so, so what's I, at the I end of the world seven... coca-cola basically <laughs> coca-cola is everywhere to the outer <laughs> limits like of the ago. earth it's got yep, it is. a lot of Coca-Cola. And so I ended up having seven bottles of Coca-Cola. And I'd had a, I'd had a dream about Coca-Cola like a few nights before when we were asleep. And uh, I had this giant bottle of Coca-Cola. So when I, um, I went back to Austria where I was living and I started doing racing was a couple of years later, I um, went to Coca-Cola and said, hey, would you sponsor me? You know, here's my story. <laughs> so I got a, a contract. Must have been exciting for them. That, that is such a cool story. And, and you know, I... I, I I want to just pull you back. For I wouldn't promote Coca-Cola now, by the way. <laughs> I've, I've grown a conscience since then, yeah. but um, it's, it's then I didn't, didn't. I mean, it still is a very cool story regardless. So you go through this situation <laughs> where you came very close to, like, like Elvis said, you, you're almost pushing your body to the point of no return. That does not sound. Yeah, good. yeah. So this is an arduous journey yeah. in length, intensity, how it taxes your body. You got out of an abusive relationship. There's a lot of e emotional wounds that you endured on this. Yeah. What was the most, yeah. what was the most valuable thing that this experience taught you? One about yourself two about, about life in general. Yeah, I think there were, this was a, a turning point. So getting out uh, of the desert and I was like physically at an all-time low so I'd lost all the feeling in my upper body my nerves uh, from the he heavy backpack I had a scoliosis in the spine my kidneys one of my kidneys was twice the size of the other kidney there was a lot of 
problems and damage to undo physically, but the mental damage was even more because then I spent the next three years trying to escape that relationship because it wasn't over. And um, <clears throat> so that, but there was a turning point in my life where I went, well, that whole time really where I went, never again is anybody going to put me in a position like that. And never again am I going to let myself be so disrespected and so, you know, to go through something like that. So it was a point where I went, that's it. I, so, I'd hit rock bottom, so to speak. So you recognize. I climbed my way out from there. Yeah. So, so first thing is recognition and acknowledgement. You realize the same thing that Elvis realized, which is, no, this is not, this is not normal. First of all, this is not mm. okay. And, and it sounds like, mm. you know, in the middle of the desert, you found yourself, you were able to claim yourself and say, okay, never again. I'm this person. And as this person, I'm taking a stand for myself. Yeah. And it wasn't, certainly wasn't as clear cut. And it took years of working through the stuff. Um, I still feel like I'm working through some of it, to be fair. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, like we were both very young and, and he'd had a very, you know, difficult upbringing and so on you know so it's no I don't want to blame anybody you know like it's, it's not my style but it's just like okay you're two little souls in the world and you're just trying to find your way and you both made some big you know muck ups um but it, it was a, a time where I I did go from the air my, my life went upwards you know what I mean I started to I started to value myself and I started to rebuild and this is where running comes into it because it took me, okay, it took me about two years to really get myself together. But then I was reading about this race in a magazine one day called the Marathon de Sables. And this is a very famous ultra marathon that's run in Morocco every year. And it's been going for a while now, about 30 something years. But back then it was pretty new and it was touted as the toughest race on earth back then. And it was a, a, around 240 kilometers, seven days. You you had to carry uh, all your food on and things, uh, equipment on your back, but you got given water and you had nine liters of water a day and you had doctors and you had a massive amount, amount of runners running with you and you had uh, all sorts. Oh, excuse me. My bloody phone's gone off, but I'll have to leave it um, <laughs> as it does on podcasts. Um, so I, I thought, I thought, I was reading about this marathon this afternoon and I was thinking, I reckon I could do that. I reckon I could have a, and I've never run a marathon or anything at this point. I've done a lot of adventure stuff, but I'd never actually been a runner per se. But I thought I, you know, same distance, uh, only 10 kilo backpacks, all the support in the world. I'm going to have a crack at this. And I was, you know, alone at that point and I wanted to have a more controlled environment to do things in. So I ended up doing this race. Cutting a long story short, I got sponsorship. I went down, Coca-Cola sponsored me, uh, I did this race. And it was the most amazing experience of my life. I realized that I was actually not too bad at this. When it came to the super, super long stuff, I was really quite good at it. And um, I was uh, getting all this encouragement from all these amazing people. Like we were, there were 700 people at this race from all around the world. And it was just like this big military camp that moved every day. And it was so exciting. And, and the people that I was in the tent with were just so supportive and like, you're amazing. And this is great. And, you know, we were all in this difficult undertaking together, but the comradeship was just amazing. And I really needed that at that time. And they were patting me on the back and telling me how well I was doing. And I needed that self-esteem at that time as well. So it just became for me, like this was the most exciting. And I was, you know, in the top five women at one point, I ended up in the top 10, which was pretty bloody good for wow. a race that size. And, and I was just super excited. So I came back from that going, Oh, bring on the next one. I'm like, that was it. So then from there, then on, I was addicted to doing it one. It sounds like that other. would be something yeah. where you would just catch on fire because you realize one, there's a community out there. So I'm, yeah. I can immerse myself in an environment where even though it's a competitive environment, we're mutually invested in one another and holy yes. shit, I've got efficacy now. I'm good yeah. at something and I can, yeah. I can channel everything that I've learned into this thing that I'm good at. And at the same time, share it with other people. That is an amazing experience, whether that shows up as a race or whether that shows up as a hobby or a career choice. Yeah. And you've been there, I think, hey, Bobby, that's why you get that. I think you get that analogy. De definitely. Uh, I I've pursued that unknowingly 
I mean, yeah. now I'm aware looking, I mean, in retrospect, yeah, we, were all good. So, we have so much insight, but I've pers- <laughs> my career has been a pursuit of that environment, but that's, wow. that's a completely different story. So it, not, not only what, what I want to get into, if, if it's okay with you, it, it is when you, when you find yourself, so you came out of that expedition, even though the relationship was actually not over yet three more years but you were different so it was the beginning of the end because it the person the who went the end, into yeah. the desert yeah, is not the same not the person same. who came out of the desert and then now you have an environment where you can channel these lessons and these found strengths to something that is mutually serves your entire community and and, and maybe where you can lose yourself in it but, but you not only learned how to show up for sport, you not only learned how to show up for yourself, you learned how to show up in a massively important way for people that you loved dearly, like, like your mom, for yeah. example. Yeah. Talk, talk to yeah, us yeah, about, yeah. about that. Do, so, do I have your permission to go there? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm, I love sharing the story because this, this is a, so yeah, you know, to, just to, to finish off the, the stories about the running. So I've ended up doing like 25 years of just crazy ultra marathons. I'm now retired, by the way, so I'm not doing them currently. Um, and the reason was because of my mum was why I retired. But I had all these adventures. I had all these successes. I had all these failures. I had these high points in, in, in this, this whole time of successes and failures and growing and changing and developing and building up your repertoire of 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 tools to help you mentally um and at the you know at the beginning I was definitely trying to prove something to people and I was trying to be cool and strong and amazing and then that morphed into how can I use this skill to help other people now that I've felt like I've you know come through the ring in myself and I've actually come out the other end and how can I how can I use this uh you know yeah, how can I raise money for charities, for example? Like I ran through New Zealand at one point, 2,250 Ks for charity and raised, raised money for Cure Kids and Canteen and doing things like that. That So the motivation changed and as, as I developed and went through different phases. But the skills that I learned along the way, these are skills like uh, they're really, really important for life, like resilience, like being able to fail and not think you're a failure. You've just failed at something mm. and that you've uh, been able to get back up again and Powerful never, ever giving up when you really, really want something. And uh, yeah, all of these things, yeah, when you when you uh, want to go after some massive goal that you're not like intimidated to think, well, I can't do that. You do initially, but you know that, uh, well, hang on a minute. I've got resources and I've got a mindset and I can, I can work through the obstacles. And so to come to a story um, five years ago. So my mum, who's been the rock of my world and just always the most amazing supportive nurturing mum that you could possibly have. She had an aneurysm, which is a massive bleed in the brain. So this is, you know, a, a major vessel in her, in her brain let go and blood went right throughout her brain. And she collapsed in the, in the, at home with, um, uh, in the early morning hours one day. And we got that phone call, get up to the hospital, mum's, you know, collapsed. We don't know what's wrong. I race up there and the ambulance driver had said on the way up, I think she's having a stroke or something neurological and had said that to the doctor and the doctor ignored him and said, ah, she's just having a migraine. And, and so he ignored her for the next six hours while she's in the emergency and we're waiting for the painkillers to kick in for this migraine. And after a few hours, she had another uh, attack where it really came on really bad. And I'm like desperate at this. I don't know what to do. The doctor's not listening to me. And so I rang a friend who was a paramedic and who worked at the hospital and she had crewed for me in Death Valley and she knew mum very well. And she came up and she took one look at mum and knew she was having a stroke. And she said to the, went to the doctor, and she's a very feisty lady and very strong. Yeah, you'll oh. get her a CT scan now or hours, six hours, six hours, and so she was dying basically while they're waiting. And this was a very uh, 
important thing because I had this med- medical misadventure already at the beginning of this journey. So I was like, well, I'm not leaving it up to everyone else to take care of my mum. I'm going to research the hell out of this. I'm going to take control as much as I possibly can if my mum survives. And I, I felt guilty that I hadn't pushed hours earlier. And, you know, so it was a lot of like, oh, I'm not going to miss the, the boat next time. And so mum was rushed down to Wellington Hospital, um, which took another 12 hours to get into the operating theatre because the ambulance, an air ambulance that had to come because we live in a regional place with no, um, you know, neurological support team. So we took 18 hours to get into surgery. They did the surgery. The surgeons did an amazing job, saved her life for the moment, but she was in critical condition. And when blood and brain... Uh, matter mix it causes spasms and it can cut off the blood supply to different parts of the brain over the next three weeks so you don't know how bad it is until you're through that time she had to have another operation um, and that caused another stroke and she was in and out of a coma for three weeks and in this time I'm just studying flat stick I'm like an eagle eye I'm picking up things that the doctors had missed and I'm like uh, you know there were for example, after this was about two months in and we were back in our local hospital and she was not recovering, she'd stabilized, but she had hardly any brain function. So she had no speech, no, um, no memory, no ability to coordinate any body functions, no control, basically like a baby in a, in a woman's body at the age of 74. And I started to notice things in her that I'd seen in myself when I'd done altitude um, races at altitude in the Himalayas, a lack of oxygen in the, in the body and bacteria and things that I was thinking, I think she's got sleep apnea. So I said to the doctors, I want a sleep apnea test. Now, this is when you stop breathing at night and yeah. you cause a lack of mm-hmm. oxygen to the brain cells and you start knocking off brain cells. And they said to me, you don't need a, she hasn't got sleep apnea. We don't need to do assessment. And I said, well, we're doing it. And I got an outside consultant, brought them into the hospital system, which is really, you know, again, against the the rules and the laws and stuff. Did the assessment, came back um, severe sleep apnea. And so she was stopping breathing hundreds of times a night. Her oxygen levels were down at 70% at night, which is just deadly, deadly. You, you wouldn't live for a couple of months if you had that sort of levels at nighttime. Um, so that was a win. So I got her on a CPAP machine, a, a machine that helped her breathe at night. And I started to notice little improvements, but the doctors were like, she's 74. We've got to get her out of the hospital system. She's stable now, but she's not ever going to do anything again. Her, her, her quality of life's over. You have to put her into an institution. And I was just like, that is not happening on my watch. At this time, I quit running, obviously, and I focused fully on her. Um, And I said, I'm taking her home and I want some support so you can get caregivers in the morning and the evening. And I had this big battle with the hospital because that would mean that she was still in their budget. And so I had this big fight with them about being able to take her home. I stuck to my guns and I've got a very big, scary looking brother who looks like The Rock and he came with me to all meetings. And I got what I needed. Good. <laughs> and so we got my mum home. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, shouldn't have to go to those links, but I but I had to. Um, I got my mum home and I come across in my studies, because I was just studying flat stick, something called hyperbaric oxygen therapy, which is really powerful for brain injury. So if anyone's listening out there, concussions, multiple sclerosis, uh, cerebral palsy, autism, ADHD, uh, strokes, go and check out hyperbaric oxygen therapy. I'd studied this and I'd heard that was really amazing for brain injuries if you had enough treatments of it. And it wasn't offered here anywhere. Um, so I, they use this in, in dive accidents for dive companies. So I approached a commercial dive company who had one of these chambers and asked them and begged them if I could use their chamber. And they said, well, if you sign a legal waiver and we're not responsible, yes, you can. So these incredible people let me do that. I signed legal responsibility for her. I got her home out of the hospital, went straight down into this factory. We stuck her on a forklift because that was the only way to get her into this chamber. And we um, put her in this chamber and we did 33 uh, sessions there, five days a week for the next month. And 
in this time, my mum started to respond. She started to, she didn't like get up and walk or anything. Like we're like, we're talking little things here, but she started to have a little bit of a flicker of intelligence. I could see that she was trying to speak. She was trying to move. And I thought this is working. And then I lost access to the chamber. So then I went, right, another obstacle. What else can I do? So I, I bought a hyperbaric chamber. I mortgaged the house, bought a hyperbaric chamber, installed it in our house. All of these things were very difficult to do. Got her this in the house, started putting her through sessions at home. In this time, she started to come back. Then I studied everything from the keto diet to nootropics to functional neurology to functional um, genetics. When studied- you say that she started to come back, what, what started to happen? She started to have a few words. She started to be moving uh, her hands. Like I, I started to teach her very, like she couldn't even sit for a start. Like she would just flop over. Mm. She had no, no awareness of where she was in space. So she had no vestibular systems, nothing online. So she was like a rag doll. And eventually I could see her like being able to sit up straight. And when I was teaching her in the That's mirror every day to what, what was straight and, and how to put food in her mouth, how to find her mouth with her hands and put food in it and how to chew everything that you would teach like from a baby size up. And then I started to teach her how to like, I'd, I'd put a, a frying pan in her hand and we'd pretend we're washing the dishes and just little wee, little wee chores that started to reconnect some of the, the damage and the hyperbaric was helping and she was on a keto diet. So she basically greens, lots of greens in the smoothie because she could hardly eat anything. Mm-hmm. Um, so she could drink through a straw. So a lot of it was, you know, a good diet. Um, and, and, and slowly but surely, we just clawed our way up the food chain. She started walking on the walker, being pulled and pushed. So she had no propulsion, but she was. That, she that's was dramatic from where she started. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and as, as the time went on, um, she started to get little bit by little bit. And there would be months, Bobby, where there was just no improvement whatsoever. But because of my mindset, I know that you just have to put in the hard work, do the grind, keep going. You know, people always ask me, even as a coach or if they're buying a supplement or something, how long before this works? And I'm like, that's the wrong attitude. Just do it. And it will take time. It will take longer than you think because everything in biology just doesn't happen like click you know we all want the magic pill and we're suddenly better that doesn't exist so so you're, if you're, willing to you're, you're using the same tools that you learned in your race yeah to kind of hold that space for your mom like obviously yep. you love your mom very deeply and when there's no yeah. improvement that's that's got to be disheartening yeah, but yeah, it, it, yeah. it was your ability to just yep. put your head down and just keep driving just keep but doing just the keep work driving. keep taking the steps it sounds a lot like Wilma Rudolph and her mother, if you know that story. Yeah, no, I do well, Wilma Rudolph, who, who, I mean, one of the most legendary runners in, in, in history, um, she had polio. And she uh-huh. was told, I mean, she didn't just have polio. Like, when she was a kid, she had a yellow fever. She had double pneumonia. She was born at four and a half pound body weight. And that's like in the oh, 1940s. Wow. So that was yeah, yeah, yeah. A, in even more serious condition than it is today. Yeah. And she was just a weak and sickly little girl, about five, six years old. She started gaining her strength back and she started playing and engaging and just her world opened up. But then people would observe that Wilma was a little bit clumsy. They labeled mm-hmm. her as, as a clumsy child, but it was more than that. Her legs started to weaken and deform underneath her when she was diagnosed with polio. Oh. Her, her doctor told this kid, and you, you're talking about what your coaches told you, how it, 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 it almost like infested inside of you, it implanted itself in you, and it took root, and it shaped a lot of your behaviors. Well, the same thing happened with her, and she just outright as a kid just gave up. But her mother, her mother was like, no no matter what my daughter is going to walk. And she talks about, you know, the amazing Rudolph story that months of painful hours, long yep, physical yep, therapy yep. sessions, as kids crying and there's no improvement coming. Yep. There's no, no improvement, improvement coming, but her mother's like, no, just do the work, do the work. And then oh one God, day in church, she gets yep. up and she starts to walk like clumsily wow. falling, dragging herself yep. down the aisle. But she walked yeah. and at, at that point it just, it just lit something in her to the point where Ed Temple, which was the running coach at her school, talked her into doing, of all things, track and field. 
and she competed yep, it. and came in yep. last place, but finished her very first race. And like, wow. if the story ended there, people go, wow, that's so inspiring. Doesn't even come close to ending there. September 7th, 1960 in Rome, Wilma Rudolph goes down as being the greatest female runner of all times by winning Holy three gold medals crap. in one Olympic games. That, and, oh and like, I'm God. listening and I'm to the story. Never... It's the same, it's the same principles. It's the same attributes that you held that space for your mother, wow. that her mother held for her. Oh man, that is just exactly except that we had a 74 year old who mm -hmm. the doctors were saying would never do yeah. anything again. And she didn't bounce, you know, like if she fell that, you mm -hmm. know, she would like, she's got a 74 year old body, a 75 year old body. Uh, and she was you know, very fragile and, and sick and old as well. Um, so for her to come back at, to this level is just absolutely amazing and that's an incredible story and there were months some apologies for these bloody phone calls <laughs> there were very absolute popular person. months of yeah apparently apparently your stock value is still no up progress. so that's good and people just going <laughs> that's good but i was like um People keep saying to me, why are you torturing your mother? Why are you putting her through such an mm -hmm. arduous daily routine? And why are you so tough on her? No and I'm surprise like, there. I treat her like an athlete. I don't treat her like a patient. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I, she goes to the gym. She's surrounded by other athletes. I talk to her like we're training for the Olympics. Mm -hmm. And we're still doing that five years into this journey now. And she's 79 wow. years old. And my mum is now completely normal again. She has her full driver's license. She has her full power of attorney. That she has is... her, she, she, she walks over three kilometers a day. She goes to the gym five days a week. I'm not even going to um, say anything. The on last that. problem we had was swimming. <laughs> she's a, oh, she's a miracle and she's 79 years because, old. Because because that's what it and, is. It is a miracle. Anything, anything day. short of that is insufficient. Yep. Yeah, it is. Very similar to Wilma's story. Um, and, and I had that vision, all I kept thinking was, was my mum is healthy and I can see her walking and I can see. So when she was in a, not much over a vegetative state, I still saw her, that's where we're going. And I had no idea if we'd ever get there, but I was just, we are going there. And this is the other thing that I found in, in, within the family is that when, when, when a crisis like this happens, somebody has to take charge and tell the family what is happening and where we're going with this. And, and my family got in behind me and they followed me to the letter, you know, and they did what I needed to do. And they trusted that I, and I had no idea what the heck I was doing, but I pretended that I do, did. And that this is where we're going, guys, follow me. Because I had no alternative. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and you needed that nowhere. level of assertion because like, if you didn't yeah. have that level of certainty, that makes people very vulnerable and very uncomfortable. So it's, it, so you, you have to take that. But I never doubt. I never, sh yeah, I never, I never, I never let doubt show in front of my family, mm -hmm. if that makes sense, especially in front of my dad who was wonderful husband and, you know, really doing his best. I, I always like, follow me, dad. I know where I'm doing. I'm knowing and going, I'm getting mum back. That's all I, you know, that was every day, every, all day, every day. Well, you have something brothers. that, a journey that long and that terrifying, you know, you, you depend on people holding yep. that level of certainty. Yeah. And, and you don't actually have it. I would come home to my husband where I had my, my supporter and I would bawl my eyes out on a regular occasion. And I'd be like my my own health went down the toilet, and I was just burning the candle at both ends because I was still running my two companies mm -hmm. and still, you know, <clears throat> trying to hold it all together. And I ended up very sick and ended up in an hour hospital and nearly dying myself. But I got through that time, and I got my mum back. And I, you know, one of the greatest like I've, I've recently had another tragedy, and that my I, I lost my my darling dad six months I'm ago. Sorry. Excuse me. Um, and I had a similar battle with him and I couldn't beat the system this time. I couldn't, he was in the ICU. He had a massive aneurysm in the, in the aorta and he was in the hospital, uh, survived the operation, 81 years old, miracle that he was still alive. He was in very good condition, like a strong, powerful fit man, but he'd smoked. 
and I could never stop him smoking. And he just wouldn't listen to me with the smoking. Um, and that's, you know, was his downfall. But he, he, he developed sepsis when he was in the hospital and he'd pulled through the operation. We thought we had him and then he went down with sepsis. And I, because of the last five years of studying, I knew that vitamin C and sepsis, I knew all the studies about that, that it was very, very powerful intravenous vitamin C, massive high doses of intravenous vitamin C in the case of sepsis have, have shown in many clinical studies. And we like vitamin C has got 50,000 studies done on it. Like Linus Pauling started along this line bloody 50 years ago and it's still not accepted. And so I was fighting against the system to get, get the ability to put uh, intravenous vitamin C into my dad. I had power of attorney. He'd been on intravenous vitamin C prior. Um, and so I was up against the, the ethics committees and the legal battles. And meanwhile, the ethics committees, you know, 20 hours a day by my dad's bedside. Yeah. The, I, I, the, the word ethics committees just for me is like the most unethical committee. You know, <laughs> I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't um, even going to focus on court, this court cases every day. Uh, it, it, it seems like <sighs> this has come up three times now in our conversation where you're in a situation really? yeah, yeah where where you feel like or you were literally not heard where, when yeah. when the well-being of someone you love dearly is at stake and you're desperately trying to be heard because you have information that can help and you're not being heard yep yeah and i'm like I, I was lucky in, in, a, in a way because I've already written books. They already know I'm an activist in this space. I'm a, I'm a, I have a podcast that's been going for five and a half years. It's in the biohacking and longevity and anti-aging space. I, I am well connected with some of the best doctors and the best scientists in the world who are trying to help me. But in my regional hospital at my local place where they had their laws, I had no power. And it didn't matter what professor or what scientist said what about the fact that this could help my father and there was no other option, I could not get through. And I had to have these court cases every day. I call them court cases where we discussed whether they were going to take him off life support. And I was fighting to get the vitamin C before they took him off life support. It took me 15 days of fighting before I was finally allowed and been able to keep him on life support for that period of time um, to give him intravenous vitamin C. I found a legal loophole. I got my local GP to came, come up and actually administer it in the hospital so that the staff at the hospital were protected. It was a legal problem. It was a legal problem. And they didn't believe it would help. Um, well, I, I mean, and, did, there did, are, there did, are they, cases did they believe worldwide. it was going to hurt? Like, what was the argument? Exactly. They like, he's dying. He's dying. There is no other option and they won't let me do something that isn't, you know what one of their arguments was, you could damage his kidneys. And I said to them, last time I looked being dead damaged your kidneys too. You know, like it's just ridiculous logic. I can't even but they imagine. were like so busy covering their asses legally that that's all that really mattered. And I had one good doctor who did advocate for me and at least got me heard. And they also knew that I had a profile and that I wouldn't go quietly, you know, whereas any other person would have just gone under the wheels of the bus mm -hmm. and they wouldn't have even had a show. Someone who, who has, who has no voice whatsoever, who, who has no resources and no power like you know, in a name in the space. And that so I eventually got it for my dad. Oh, and, and, and I, I, the very first intravenous vitamin C, it halved his uh, CRP, his C-reactive protein markers, which is an inflammatory marker. It halved it. His white blood cell account improved massively and his kidney function went up from 27% to 33%. And that was after one, but you need the intravenous vitamin C. Mm -hmm. You need it every six hours and you need big doses. And they stopped me doing the second and they stopped me doing the third. And I had to push even, every even single after time. And then the after results, they the stopped fifth, you from doing it. Yep. Yep. I, I can't even imagine oh, suddenly what the is going on in your head. Oh yeah, I was desperate and I'm trying not to lose my shit because, you know, I'm wanting to punch heads at this point and I can't because they hold the life support keys oh, for my God. father it's and I'm exhausted. Like I haven't slept very much in the whole time that he's been in there, the absolute, you know, minimum 
and I, I, I'm not thinking very straight anymore. And I was trying not to lose my rag at these people, you know, and um, on the, uh, my dad died with the intravenous vitamin C going into his veins. I, I fought them to the last second, but they took him off life support and I, I lost him, you know, and it's just, it, it's devastating. It's devastating because I know that if I'd had that from day one, not day 15, my dad would be with us. And, you know, the, the, the biggest consolation for me is, um, number one, I'm going to get this change come hell or high water. Um, and so now I'm, you know, adding my voice to the hundreds of doctors and scientists around the world who are calling for this not only in sepsis, but for in cancer treatments, in uh, ARDS, in pneumonia, in COVID even. Um, so, you know, we will eventually win through, but it will probably be another 20 to 30 years, I'd, I'd say, because that's how slow. One of the scientists said to me, um, or Dr. Thomas Levy, it was a, a doctor, cardiologist, he said, the, it takes 20 years to move the ship. You said uh, critical care is like moving a big oil tank. It, it takes mm. 20 years for it to come around. And they're so far behind the eight ball. Um, and, Imagine and things that's the case in any quick. major industry. Change comes very slow yeah. indeed. Yeah. yeah. It just takes so long for that technology. And this is the beautiful thing about uh, things like podcasts and stuff. We can get access to the greatest minds, the greatest science, the latest. We've got the internet. We've got PubMed. We've got, we can research ourselves. Mm. We're not just limited to what the local doctor says in there because they're busy and they don't have time to study your particular ailment. And so, if moving know, an industry is like uh, the resources an oil tanker, and all the rest of it that goes into it, I, I would imagine that a similar yeah, analogy yeah, yeah, yeah. is and you making your own personal decisions to take responsibility for your own health and well being. That's kind of like moving a speedboat that you can do immediately and you can be quite nimble. I mean, the preparation and the variables that go into change that takes a while, it, you know, human behavior is not that simple, but the actual change itself, you can tomorrow theoretically do something different that puts you on the right path. Exactly. So and, that's, and that's, whole and that's the shift. space. Yeah, and that's the space that we're both in now. In the, for me, it's about health optimization and prevention and finding out the latest information and helping my clients because we you know, do this for a job. I, I, I um, have an epigenetics program now and I, um, I have a health optimization. Helping people access the information from the best minds in the well, world. You know, you know what I, I noticed about you is community is something you brought up earlier and you're an, you like to advocate for people. It's almost not even something you do. It's almost like a signature strength of yours. Advocacy. Never thought of it like that, but yeah. So, <laughs> Bose, yeah. It, I like it, to, I like to people that need the, 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 the people that aren't being heard, the people that you know, like in, in fighting for causes that are, you know, really dear to my heart, obviously, um, because I know, unfortunately, my life situation, and these experiences are not just me. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. I get the, I get the stories because of the, I share this. So I hear everybody's stories and I can tell you there is just in our local town. There are thousands of people in, in, their, in their country, at least who have written to me over the past few years and have said to me, I have experienced something similar. I went through this. I was not listened to. I was treated like this. I was, and it's like, this is not good enough. We yeah. have to do better. So it's, that you, you, you know? seem to have a strong writing reflex, a strong sense of compassion, a strong sense of justice, all, all supporting a sense of advocacy. You know, I'm going to do something now that might make you feel a little bit uncomfortable because we're, we're coming to the end of time. Would you, would you be willing mm. to self-promote a little bit? Like where, what, you, you're a renowned <laughs> author, you know, where can we find information? Where can we find your books? Yeah. Look, Hey, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. And I do appreciate that. Cause that, you know, like 
when your passion is your profession, then you get to actually do something that's going to help mm-hmm. people anyway. So it has become my profession now doing all this. So people can um, reach out to me at lisatamati.com. That's T-A-M-A-T-I. Um, and that's where I houses all my sort of my courses and my programs, my epigenetics, my mindset courses, my running, uh, coaching my books, uh, my podcast. My podcast is called Pushing the Limits. Um, it's been going for five and a half years. Bobby's going to come on the show, aren't you, mate? You, you're, you're on next week, hopefully. Um, oh, I, can, I, be, I can't wait. Yeah, I can't wait to share your story because it's pretty phenomenal. Um, and yeah, so Pete, uh, I, I'm all over the place. Um, uh, on YouTube, I have a big YouTube channel with um, 500 odd videos on there and lots of documentaries on ultra marathon running if you like watching docos uh <laughs> reach out to me so yeah lisa tamati.com is the is the hub for for everything lisa thank you so much i want to have you back on because we could probably talk for five hours um a lot of value here <laughs> really appreciative thank you <laughs>